Ah, nails on a chalkboard. To think there was a day that those words would leave my mouth, that I would actually ask that kind of a question, just really puts things into perspective. And what answer did I get? First, the guy looked at me like he just saw an alien. It was very clear that either he didn't know the company values that well, or was so incredibly caught off guard by such a ridiculous question that he knew he'd be grasping at straws to give me a response. And folks, grasp he did. He started talking in circles, saying something like, well, I've been with the company 20 years, and back in the day, things were all complicated and all over the place, and they've been working to streamline things and blah, 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 blah. I nodded my head some. Then he went blah, 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 some more. And then finally he goes, does that answer your question? And now, Streaming at you in living color from the far reaches of podcast land, America's white collar wise guy, the career conciliary. What do you hear? What do you say? Jimmy with you, as always, for what we hope to be a highly informative and engaging half an hour or so. Today, we will address a topic that has been intentionally ignored in previous episodes because, as promised, I plan on devoting an entire episode specifically to it. Yes, this is where we talk about the types of questions you, as the candidate, get to ask during the interview. We talked all about the stuff that the interviewers are going to ask you when they're shining the flashlight in your face, figuratively speaking. But now we flip the script and put you in the driver's seat. We'll talk about what you, as the interviewee, should ask, what you should not ask, and how to use questions strategically to make the interview feel less like an inquisition and more like a conversation. Lots on deck, podcast land, so let's get it. This, my friends, is another example of the severely misguided narrative about the job interview process that was drilled into our heads growing up. If the quote-unquote wisdom you received from your seventh grade careers teacher was anything like the garbage I was fed back then, you were basically taught to go into the interview, be an obedient little puppy, and act like you were about to have a conversation with God himself. You were told to be obsequious, subservient, all the other SAT words I can think of that are synonymous with just being a complete slave to the interview, and to basically do all but bow your head in gratitude at the chance to have this conversation that, at best, allows you to make just enough money to cover most of the bills every month. Sick situation when you think of it that way. We were all told to act like little kids and to basically speak when spoken to, only asking questions at the very end of the interview when the interrogator, sorry, the interviewer, says it's okay to do so. Unfortunately, folks, This is the state that many of us regress into when we walk into the interview room or we fire up the virtual meeting, however it plays out. We completely forget that the job is for us, not the other way around. And look, it all goes back to you being the boss of your career. Just like I remind you at the end of every episode, I say that for a reason because it's absolutely true. You are the boss of your career. And you're interviewing for whatever job because you want to determine, as the candidate, whether the job is a fit for you, whatever that means in your case, whatever your circumstances are. You want to know that this job fits you, your life, your situation, your family, your whatever, not the other way around. But I can completely understand how intimidating the interview situation can be especially for those of you out there listening that might be a little less experienced, maybe you're earlier in your career, it can definitely be an intimidating experience, no question. Probably the most intimidated I ever was in an interview, here's a story for you. Back when I was in college, it was, would have been the summer between my junior and senior years, I had an interview for an internship at a very well-known media outlet here in the New York area. And the only quote unquote professional, big boy, real job, whatever you want to call it, experience that I had backing me up was my restaurant work experience. You guys remember the story about the bananas from a previous episode. I had that going for me and about a month worth of HR internship experience that I had working at a little hotel in the town where I went to college. So all things considered, not a whole ton of professional work experience. 
So here I am sitting in the lobby of a very, very well-known media outlet, Midtown Manhattan. And I remember I'm sitting there in the lobby. I got my resume out in front of me. I'm practically shaking, trying to memorize the damn thing in preparation for the interrogation I was about to endure or what I thought was going to be an interrogation. Turned out to not be an interrogation at all. It was actually one of the easiest interviews of my life. And thinking back on it, I should have known that because the job didn't pay anything except academic credit. So here I am thinking I'm going to get grilled for an unpaid internship, when in reality, it was really just more of a get-to-know-you conversation. just shows you how warped your perspective can be when you don't have the experience backing you up. But that's another story. But while I was sitting there in this lobby having a serious case of Ajita, I remember seeing a whole bunch of people that I recognized from TV walking by me. Well-known actors, big media personalities, radio guys. And a whole bunch of others that I recognized here and there, people I'd seen in commercials. I was like, what is this? I went from working in a hotel and, and buying bananas at the friggin' restaurant to now I got people I, I recognize and see on TV every day walking by me and saying, hey, how you doing on the way in? Crazy stuff. Could you have put 20-year-old me in any more of an intimidating situation? And in the context of the interview that I was about to go for, was I in any position to start asking strategic questions and controlling the cadence of the interview when the person sitting across from me at the other end of the table was 20 years my senior and ran in the same circles as some of these celebrities that were walking past me? How could I have possibly done that? How could I have possibly controlled the narrative of this interview to turn the tide in my favor? Would have been impossible. And look, I realize that the average corporatopian, all of you out there listening, may or may not have ever been in a situation like this. Most job interviews, you're probably not having A-list celebrities walk by you while you're sitting in the lobby. I realize that's kind of a unique experience, but it's all relative. Maybe the senior vice president of said business unit that you're meeting with that day in your interview has the same effect on you that the actors and the famous sportscasters had on me that day. Doesn't matter, it's all relative. And if that's the case, regardless of who's there, who's not there, what their net worth is, it can be easy to clam up and become a complete slave to the situation at hand. But the good news is not only can you prevent this from happening, you can also use the art of asking questions to establish yourself in the interview and steer the conversation in ways that are going to help you speak from a position of strength. Let's take a look at how. It all starts before the interview even happens. It starts when you're home preparing for the interview. Remember in previous episodes, we talked about how you should do research on the company, look up the interviewers on LinkedIn, all that stuff. Well, that's also when we develop our list of questions to ask during the interview. As you're researching the company, you're reading over the job posting, your mind, being the naturally curious human being that you are, is going to begin to wonder things. And when this happens, jot down all the questions that come to mind. Here are some things you should be genuinely curious about and would be appropriate to ask during your phone screening. We'll talk about the phone screening first, and then we'll move on to what you should ask during the round two interview with the hiring manager. First, the phone screen. What is the work arrangement? Is it in person, virtual? Is it hybrid? It's always good to know where you're going to physically be to perform this job. And the recruiter, talent acquisition should be able to answer that. Is travel a part of this role? If so, what percentage of time should you expect to spend out on the road? Very, very fair question to ask. That can be a deal breaker for some people. So it's always good to get a sense of, of that, to really understand what the physical commitment is that you're going to have to make to this job. Another one, what is the general schedule or the hours you'd be expected to work? Also very important. For a majority of corporate type jobs like we talk about, it's going to be your standard 9 to 5, 8 to 5, 7.30 to 4, something along those lines most of the time. But there are exceptions depending on the industry that you work in, the kind of company that it is. Let's say you're working in customer service, you're on the East Coast, you're, support, you're supporting West Coast customers. Maybe instead of 9 to 5, your hours are, are noon to 8. So. A fair question to ask just to get an idea of what the hours are going to be and what's going to be expected of you, what times of the day you're going to need to be available, and so on. And also, another good question to ask in the phone screen, where in the organization does this role sit and what specific team does it support? 
it's always really, really good to know ahead of time where your role fits into the scope of the company because using that information, you can take that into round two when you meet with the hiring manager and knowing that ahead of time will be incredibly helpful. Sometimes the job posting will spell it all out for you, but in a lot of cases it won't. It'll give you very vague information. So it's always good to clarify this. And then when, once you meet with the hiring manager, it'll kind of, your knowledge of where this role sits in the organization will be, it'll be attractive to them because it'll show that you took some time to really research it and really gain an understanding of it before you even met with them. Remember, since the phone screening is almost always with a talent acquisition person, a recruiter essentially, they're probably not going to know the intricate details, all the ins and outs of the role itself. So you want to keep the questions like we just went through surface level, nothing too deep here. A good amount of this information should have been included in the job posting, and most of the time it is, but it's always good to pick the interviewer's brain a little bit further just to get a little more information and to make sure that what the talent acquisition person tells you is consistent with what the job posting says. Unfortunately, it's all too common for the job posting to be completely different from the reality of how the job actually plays out in practice. And one of the best ways to catch this ahead of time is to make sure that there's consistency between what you read on the posting and what the company's story is when they actually answer your questions. So, at that point, if you realize that they might be pulling the bait and switch on you, at that point, you can bail out if you have to. If you don't feel comfortable anymore, if you feel like you're being sold a false bill of goods, you can totally dip at that point. So up to you, and this is a great place, a great way for you to catch that if it's happening. When you make it to round two with the hiring manager, here is where you empty the chamber, figuratively speaking. Here you can ask all the role and company-specific questions that you want because there is no better person to answer those questions for you than the hiring manager. As we've said before, they're your potential boss and they should be pretty knowledgeable on the company, especially if they've been around for a while. So they should be able to tell you what's up. Here are the kind of things you'll wanna ask about. What specific types of activities and projects might you be involved in? You should already have a damn good understanding of what the job does from reading the posting, from having already been through a first round interview, from doing all your research. But here you can get specific. There could be something on the posting that makes references to a specific type of project or something. And here's where you can dig a little deeper and ask for more information. Another great question to ask, is this a new role? If so, what drove the company's investment in it? It's good to know that. I mean, if it's a new role, that's exciting, right? And you potentially coming in off the street have the opportunity to make an impact and to kind of shape how, how that function exists in the company. And you'll also want to understand why, why the company decided to invest in that role, what's happening in the company that brought that need to life. So understanding that and having that information will kind of help put into perspective a little bit for you, the company itself and what kinds of things are going on in the company, which for you coming in from the outside is a very good thing to know. Another question you could ask, if the role has existed in the past, how has success been measured? Fair question. It's always good to know what's going to be expected of you and what KPIs, key performance indicators, if you will, are going to, are you going to be accountable for reaching? So that's very, very good for you to have in mind as you go in. And then even before you start the job, you can start thinking about, all right, here's how I might want to approach this. And if I'm, I might want to approach that because these are the end goals. So you can kind of give yourself a running start between interviewing and actually starting the job. If you know, or at least kind of have an idea of what some of the KPIs are going to be ahead of time. Another great question to ask here, how is the team set up? Who else are you going to be working with and what do they do? You can't accomplish it alone, guys. It's any corporate job like this. It's almost always going to be a team environment. And it's always very good to get an understanding of who you're going to be working with. You don't need specific names at, at this point, but titles might be helpful. And more importantly, the functions that they do. If you're a finance analyst, let's say, who else might you be working with? Who else might be able to support you? Who else might you be expected to support? All fair things and all very good things to know. And finally, what is the scope of the role? Are you going to be working cross-functionally, regionally, globally? 
or is it just going to be within your own team? This kind of question will give you a sense of how how broad is the role? What's your level of exposure and visibility for you going to be specifically? Really good things to understand going in. Up until now, guys, the hiring manager has been having their way with you. They've been asking you all kinds of really hard questions. So this is your chance to make this conversation finally a two-way street. And as you've seen, it's pretty easy to script out solid questions for rounds one and two. You know who you're meeting with. You have a pretty good idea what the context of the conversation is going to be and things like that. But after you get through round two, once you're on to rounds three and any rounds beyond round three, if there are any, you're pretty knowledgeable on the job and on the company. But you won't really know who you're meeting with until you get the itinerary for rounds three and beyond. So once you finally do, what I would recommend as far as preparing for questions to ask, you're going to want to tailor the questions to the specific parties that you're going to be meeting with. So what you do, let's say that you get your itinerary and one of the people that you're going to be meeting with happens to be the executive. He or she is the executive vice president of the business unit that your team rolls up to. You might keep the questions more high level for somebody like that. Maybe you ask about big initiatives within the department, within that business unit, maybe some cool company things that have been in the press recently, and really just get a sense of, of what's going on in the organization. And at a very high level, how does your role uh, fit into all of that? That would be something you could do for an executive. Let's say also in one of these rounds, you're meeting with somebody parallel to you or somebody that's possibly even more junior to you. That happens too. Sometimes you interview down. Sometimes you talk to people. If you're interviewing for a, a management level role, don't be surprised if you talk to a coordinator or an analyst or, or something like that. They try to get multiple perspectives on you from all angles. So that could very well happen. For somebody like this, maybe you ask questions more about the specific challenges they face and what somebody like you might want to be aware of as you go in. A person that's on a more junior level to you in an organization, they're going to be the ones in the trenches. I mean, they're going to be dealing with the real hard stuff, the reports that don't want to run, the systems that keep crashing, like all that nuts and bolts type stuff, That that's going to be their issue. So you can learn a lot from them and the kind of stuff they go through. So if your job is kind of one, one or two rungs up from them, things tend to flow downstream. So by getting a sense of the challenges and the things they face, you'll have a pretty good idea of some curveballs that might be coming your way if you're hired. Very important here. Regardless of who you're meeting with, what level they're at in the organization, doesn't matter. Do not wait until the end of the interview to start asking your questions. Here's where you can start really taking the reins back in the conversation. And look, I know that we've been told to do this from the beginning. All of the wisdom out there, all the coaching you've probably received in the past tells you to hold all your questions until the end. But I'm going to have you challenge that. When something comes up during the interview that you're genuinely curious about, please, please, always stop the interviewer and ask to explore that further. Look, they're still going to ask you at the end if you have questions. That's going to happen. It's happened in every single interview that I've been in, and I've been in lots of them. But you'll know when the conversation reaches that point, you'll know that you've had a successful interview up until then when your list of remaining questions is very slim. And with that said, when they do finally ask you, you should still ask at least one or two. This will show that you're still engaged and eager to learn more, even after having gone through a pretty tough interview round. But by this point, the only things left on your list to ask should be small details. How might these mid-interview questions look like live? Let's look at an example. Let's say you're going to be working as a field service technician for a commercial HVAC company. You're in the interview. Hiring manager says something like, okay, you're going to be covering a territory that covers the five boroughs, Westchester, Rockland, and anything in Jersey north of Route 80. All right. It's easy to glaze over and get lost in thought in a situation like this. I know I certainly would, knowing the area. While you're envisioning yourself driving your boxy, squeaky van with a completely shot suspension in gridlock traffic from Canarsie, Brooklyn to Hackensack at 7 o'clock in the morning. But rather than get lost in that horrible daydream, here's where you can seize the opportunity to ask a question like, 
You know something? If I can stop you there for a minute, I was actually wondering, the van I'd be driving, what's the clearance on it? Am I able to fit under the overpasses on the Belt Parkway, or do I have to take the BQE like all the trucks do? And look, this might sound like Greek to anyone that's not from the New York area, but basically what's going on here is the candidate, knowing they're going to be spending their days out on the road, is asking a very specific question that has a huge influence on so many things. What roads you're allowed to take with a commercial vehicle in New York is a touchy subject. A lot of roads out here, for anybody who's not familiar with the area, a lot of roads over here are closed to commercial traffic. For example, my father drives an 18-wheeler. So what I can do in a regular passenger car in two hours literally takes him all day because he's got two roads he can use. I got 20. So in a situation like this, I'm using this example because the route driver, simply by asking the kinds of roads that somebody in that job is going to be able to use, now has a very good idea of how they're going to need to plan their customer visits, what time they're going to need to start their day, how they can plan to navigate around, how long certain things are going to take, and when they can expect to get home. And in the interview, the interviewer may or may not have planned on getting into these specifics. So had the candidate not asked that one simple question about the van clearance, they could be in for a nasty surprise on day one when they get stuck in traffic coming home and they miss their kid's little league game. It can happen. Also think about what else this does. Now, the focus of the conversation has been shifted to the candidate, and the door is now open for this route driver to ask about whether or not the company pays for tolls, whether route drivers can bring the company vehicle home at night, how the fuel allowance works, and a whole avalanche of other aspects of the job that are absolutely mission critical, but may or may not come up in those lovely, tell me about a time when types of questions. The candidate now has a choice to keep pressing with further questions or to turn the cadence of the interview back over to the interviewer to continue with the original agenda. It's up to them at this point. So you see what happened? Even if only for a brief time, the candidate has essentially flipped the script on the interviewer and has taken the wheel in the conversation. No pun intended for a route driver. But you, you out there, even though you may not be applying to be a route driver, Take this very same principle and apply it to the context of your specific job, whatever it happens to be, and hopefully, in a similar way, some things will start to come into focus. Everything we've covered up until now, all good questions to ask, all solid strategies to use. But let's look at the flip side. What should you not ask during an interview? There are lots of things you should stay away from. For one, let's first talk about salary. Now, be aware. In previous episodes, remember what we talked about, this all gets handled during the phone screening. So I'm not saying don't talk about salary at all. I'm saying since it was handled in the phone screening, there's no need to talk about it again until if the day comes where you receive the offer. So salary's off the table. The recruiter handled that already. They know the kind of money that you're looking for. That information should have been passed on. Shouldn't come up again. If it does, be concerned. The only salary type questions that are appropriate to ask in these later rounds, rounds two and beyond, is anything having to do with special case scenarios like commissions, bonuses, any other kind of incentive-based compensation. If you have questions about how that's structured or how it's relative to the specifics of the job, what you have to do to attain it, what kind of KPIs are around it, really specific day-to-day -day things involving these special case compensation scenarios, that's okay to ask about. But otherwise, salary happens during the phone screen and when you eventually receive an offer. That's it. Another thing you'll want to avoid, what I call hot air questions. A hot air question, according to the very official conciliary definition, is a question that is focused on esoteric, lofty ideals and forces the interviewer to come up with some indirect, politically correct, theoretical, completely BS answer that does nothing except emit their hot breath into the room. Hot air question. You get it? Hope you like it. Very good. For example, and here's a live example of what this looks like. Back in one of my very first interviews early in my career, I think it was the second job interview that I ever went on, the company I was interviewing with had keep it simple 
quote unquote, as one of their corporate values. And as a 21 year old, soon to be negative net worth college graduate, I remembered what all my college career counselors and textbooks told me, which was exactly this. During an interview, ask about asinine, superfluous things like this. So the question that left my mouth that day was something like, in my research on the company, I paid close attention to the corporate values. Could you tell me more about Keep It Simple and how the employees at your organization enact this value on a daily basis? Ah, nails on a chalkboard. To think there was a day that those words would leave my mouth, that I would actually ask that kind of a question, just really puts things into perspective. And what answer did I get? First, the guy looked at me like he just saw an alien. It was very clear that either he didn't know the company values that well or was so incredibly caught off guard by such a ridiculous question that he knew he'd be grasping at straws to give me a response. And folks, grasp he did. He started talking in circles, saying something like, well, I've been with the company 20 years and back in the day, things were all complicated and all over the place and they've been working to streamline things and blah, 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 blah. I nodded my head some. Then he went blah, 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 some more. And then finally he goes, does that answer your question? Is asking a question like this really going to accomplish anything? Did anything this guy told me in his half-assed, scrambled mess of a response really enlighten me and make an impact on my perception of the company? Not one bit. All I did by doing that was put the poor guy on the spot and waste two full minutes of a tight schedule. He was a nice guy. I actually kind of felt bad. His intentions were all good, but questions like this about PR-focused, image-driven, surface-level, optical aspects of a company, stay away from that. Look, you have no way of truly knowing how a company operates until you start working there. Companies, lots of times, will talk a great game, they'll have great PR, and then when you get on the inside, you realize what a sham it is. Unfortunately, it happens all the time. But nonetheless, this should give you an idea of the concept. If you're asking questions in an interview, keep them focused on the job itself. And if you do ask about the company, ask about concrete, tangible things. How the company is set up, what are the main goals at play, what are some of the key initiatives going on, and anything else that directly affects your role and your contribution and you as a team member. Some other questions to avoid. Never ask about things like PTO or other non-salary benefits, retirement plans, insurance coverage, discount phone plans, gym memberships, other perks, all that kind of stuff. Stay away from it. Things like this will be explained when you get the job offer. And unfortunately, even then, most of the time, you don't really have much negotiation room on stuff like that. These are usually contracted arrangements made with external vendors, and you as the employee, you get what you get. So it's senseless to ask about this stuff during job interviews. I've heard of people in the middle of like a second or third round interview start asking about 401k matches, and it's like, what are you doing? No, save that for if and when you get the offer. Don't waste valuable time talking about stuff that at the end of the day, it is what it is. And this one, too, may sound like common sense, but definitely don't go asking about anything that makes you look like you haven't done your research as a candidate. For example, uh, what will I be doing in this role? Look, you can and should ask about specific projects and tasks that you'll be doing, but this assumes that you already have a basic understanding of what your general job function and purpose for existence is going to be. So if you go and ask some dumb question like, uh, what am I going to be doing in this job? It's going to make you look clueless and disengaged. And this one is a big no-no. Yet, unfortunately, it's one that I've had mentors and even former bosses of mine recommend I do. Much to my own detriment, honestly. It's never worked any time I've done it. But here's what it was. At the end of the interview, my mentors back then told me to close out the interview. Close them out was the phrasing they like to use. And I was supposed to do this by asking something at the very end to the effect of, how did I do? Do you see any reason why this wouldn't work out? This is the ultimate hot air question. What can they possibly tell you right then and there? What do you want them to say? Yeah, bro, you rock. You know what? Screw our process and all the other people that we interviewed. Let's have HR draft you up an offer letter right now. Guys, 
all the interview will ever say in response to this question is, well, we still have however many people left to interview, and we hope to have a decision made by whatever date uh, so-and-so from Talent Acquisition will be in touch with Next Steps. So tell me, is you putting the interviewer on the spot and being really aggressive and confrontational like this supposed to make them think, whoa, look how badass they are, such confidence, they're the one, no doubt, hire them now. Don't even bother. If you're looking to close out the interview, you can literally accomplish the same exact thing by simply saying, thank you for speaking with me today, really enjoyed the conversation, and hopefully we speak again soon. Just by saying that, something as simple and cordial and professional as that, you send the message that while you're still very interested, you will respect whatever decision the company makes and won't become a stage five cling when they don't answer your follow-up emails. Because we all know the kind of person who's going to do this big dramatic closeout at the end of the interview is exactly the type of person that's going to send 14 unanswered follow-up emails. We've seen it happen a million times. So you want my opinion? This is a way better approach than putting people on the spot, making everyone uncomfortable, and in plain English, just being a total jackass. We covered a lot about interview questions today, the questions you should ask. So let's summarize and package everything up in today's conciliary call to action. During an interview, most of us were always taught to speak when spoken to, answer the questions, and essentially act like you're on the witness stand. Not how it should be at all. Bad advice. The best way that you can establish yourself and hold your own during an interview is to artfully and tactfully ask questions as the conversation is going on. This shows curiosity, confidence, and turns the interview into more of a conversation than an inquisition. The best way to do this is to do your research ahead of time and to come to the interview ready with questions specific to whoever you're going to be meeting with at the time you're going to be meeting with them. Make sure that you're asking the right people the right stuff. And while you never want to wait until the very end to ask all your questions, you definitely still want to ask some questions at the end when they prompt you for it. But if you've been proactive in the conversation up until that point, the list of remaining questions that you have should be pretty slim by the time you reach. Being strategic with your questions can also open new doors and lead the conversation places it wouldn't have otherwise got. Think back to the example of our route driver and everything you can learn about a job or by a company or about the operation by simply asking the right question that sets off a chain reaction. Finally, there's also a bunch of stuff that you should not ask during an interview. Absolute no-nos. For one, avoid those lofty hot air questions that do nothing but warm up the room. Also, stay away from anything pertaining to compensation or benefits. The phone screen and the offer are the place for that. You also want to avoid any questions that make you look unprepared. No, folks, the interview is not the time to go asking what the company does. You should be going in there already pretty knowledgeable from all the research that you've done in advance of the interviews. And definitely, absolutely avoid any overly confrontational closeouts at the end of an interview. You're not getting hired on the spot. The company has a process to follow, and you being extra bold, especially this day and age, does little more than make you appear cocky and possibly even a little bit desperate. And I know that it's kind of an oxymoron to use those two words in the same sentence, but these are strange times, people. And sadly, folks, that's all the time we have for today. But have no fears and shed no tears, because I'll be back with a new episode every week. As they say in the industry, no listeners, no show. So do me a favor and stay loyal. If you find value in my content, please leave me a nice review. Tell all your friends. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and follow on whatever platform you use to get your podcasts. And beyond the confines of your headphones, speakers, TV screen, or any other crazy contraption that I failed to mention with the ability to stream audio, I also provide one-on-one -on -one career assistance. So take a visit to my website at career-conciliary.net to learn more about me, book me for one-on-one -on -one coaching, join my email list, or explore some of the other career services that I offer. And to all of you out there in podcast land, remember this, who's the boss in your career? You, nobody else.